As Colonel Ogudacheya sends a force of dragoons to reclaim a cannon from the rebellious town of Gonzales, a senseless army of 500 men land in Capano Bay. This force, led by Santa Ana's brother-in-law General Martin Perfecto de Cos, is sent to assist the beleaguered garrison in San Antonio de Bejar. Cos, a career army soldier who rose to the ranks from a cadet to become a general in the Mexican army, is tasked in the rebellion that has sprung up in the state. Upon his arrival, Cos makes his intentions clear to the people of Texas. The plans of the revolutionists of Texas are well known to this commandancy, and it is quite useless and vain to cover them with a hypocritical adherence to the federal constitution. The constitution by which all Mexicans may be governed is the constitution which the colonists of Texas must obey, no matter on which principles it may be formed. Despite his clear intentions, the obdurate Coast misjudges how the determined people of Texas would insist the principles be federalist. An internet VPN is a lot like building a fort. You want to be safe and secure wherever you are. You want to make sure you and your valuables are protected all the time. That is why I protect my stuff with defenses, both in person and online. And when I'm online, I use NordVPN to protect my internet data. Today's sponsor. You can get NordVPN today by clicking on my link nordvpn.com warhawk down in the description. To ring in the new year, NordVPN is having an exclusive deal where if you get their two-year plan, you also get four extra months for free. I never venture online without using NordVPN. I always want to keep me and my devices safe from malware, trackers, and ads as I go about the internet. All the traffic I generate online is protected with robust encryption, ensure my data is completely safe from prying eyes. Thanks to Nord, if my information is ever leaked, I will be notified immediately and can use Nord's kill switch if it is ever exposed. That is the one of NordVPN. After all that, if you're still not satisfied with the service, you're guaranteed your money back within 30 days of your purchase. So go ahead, get NordVPN today and see how it protects your online data. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. If you want to get NordVPN today, you can get it by clicking on my link nordvpn.com warhawk down in the description. Once Costa's force is ready to move, he marches his men north to San Antonio de Bejar to assume command of the state. While Costa's army marches north, 20 Texian volunteers from Matagorda form a company to oppose this new threat. On October 6, adhering to American militia tradition, the men of the company elect Mississippian George M. Collinsworth as captain. Once all the officers are elected, the men of the company vote to attack the Presidio La Baya near the town of Goliad. Once the decision is made, Collinsworth invites the men from the surrounding communities to join his expedition as they march towards Goliad. The next day, Collinsworth stops his force at Victoria to rest his men and await reinforcements to arrive at the rendezvous point. While the Texians are camping near the Guadalupe River, they receive news that Coast has departed La Baya for Bejar. However, it is also reported that Coast failed to bolster the garrison at the Presidio which holds a garrison of 50 men. After waiting two more days to increase their force to 125 men, the Texans march off towards Goliad in the Presidio La Baya. On October 9th, the Texans arrive on the outskirts of Goliad in its old fort. However, as the Texans near the town, they run into a lone figure hiding in the mesquite trees. His name is Ben Milam. Benjamin Milam, a native of Kentucky, was a filibuster and impresario who was on the run from the Mexican government. When Milam heard of the outbreak of hostilities in Texas, he traveled north to join the ranks of the Federalist. Once Collinsworth gets his men into position outside Goliad, he calls for the town to surrender. Not surprisingly, the town decides to remain neutral and refuse the request. With his request refused, Collinsworth's men attack the next morning, swarming the fort with a little opposition. The small Mexican garrison fights until the Texans breach the walls and surrender when further resistance is useless. The captured Goliad is held as another great victory for Texian arms. As the Texans scour the fort for loot, they find military supplies that will be invaluable to the fledgling army of Texas. For Coes, the loss is detrimental. His supply line to Capano Bay is now severed, and any future supplies will have to travel over land from the interior of Mexico. With morale high after their easy victory, the Texans are now more than eager to rid the rest of the state of centralist tyranny. 
Only two more centralist garrisons stand in their way, Fort Le Pantalon near San Patricio and San Antonio de Bejar. As Kos is facing the reality of his increasingly desperate situation in Bejar, 63 miles to the east, an army of militiamen, volunteers, and soldiers of fortune are gathering in Gonzales to march upon the premier city in Texas. The citizen soldiers are flushed with pride as they have bested their opponents twice in battle at Gonzales and Goliad. They are now ready to take on the large garrison that holds on tight to the tenuous position in Bejar. Both sides know it is only a matter of time before the Federalist soldiers assault the barricades constructed by the Mexican garrison. On October 11th, taxi and volunteers gather in Gonzales and unanimously elect Stephen F. Austin as their commander-in-chief. Though Austin has a limited amount of military experience, he's widely respected for his sound judgment and leadership. Austin knows that his little army faces many obstacles if they are to overcome the sizable garrison in Bejar. The Commander-in-Chief gets to work shaping up his force, naming it the Army of the People. This ragtag army has an initial strength of 300 men, filled by an assorted groups of individuals, mostly being farmers or frontiersmen. Realizing that the Mexicans have the advantage in artillery and cavalry, Austin is advised to utilize his army's strengths, his Kentucky riflemen. Compared to his Mexican counterpart, the impetuous Texian volunteer lacks formal military training but he is dedicated to the cause he fights for. He is a crack shot with his American-made Kentucky long rifle, and he has years of experience fighting both the natives and wildlife. Conversely, the centralist soldiers stationed in the frontier regions of the Mexican Republic have little love for the land they are protecting, and mainly come from the bottom rungs of society. However, there are a few battalions that are worth their weight in gold, such as the Matamoros Battalion, who recently arrived with Kos, Unlike the conscripts in the infantry, the Mexican horsemen are fearsome fighters, whom Santa Ana copied from the daunted French cavalry in Napoleon's Grand Army. Lacking bayonets, these will be the only troops that Texian riflemen will truly fear on the battlefield. Upon hearing of the repulse at Gonzales and the loss of Goliad, Co starts fortifying his position in Bejar by barricading the avenues that lead to the town squares while also strengthening the decaying walls of the Alamo which sits across the San Antonio River. This mission turned fort was built in 1718 and was only in operation until 1793. A decade later, the mission was converted into a military outpost by a company of horsemen from the Mexican town of Alamo de Peras, from whom it received its name. Once all his preparations are complete, Cos will be defending Bejar and the Alamo with 647 men. On October 12th, the Texian army moves out from its staging ground in Gonzales for Bejar. After a week of marching, Austin's army nears the fortified city on October 19th. Being an inferior force with no artillery, assaulting the fortifications is out of the question. Therefore, Austin opts to lay siege to the town. His decision to starve the garrison is also encouraged by the arrival of a few companies of Tejano Rancheros under the intrepid Juan Seguin. Thanks to many years in the saddle, these Hispanic riders rival even the wild Comanches in horsemanship. With the best horsemen at his fingertips, Austin will use them to patrol the perimeter of the town and prevent supplies from reaching the besieged garrison. With his plan of action set, Austin decides to move his base of operations closer to the town. The general's goal is to find a new base that is near Bejar, but is also easily defendable if the Mexicans sally out for an attack. On October 24th, Austin selects Colonel James Bowie to lead the expedition. Bowie, a 39-year-old Kentuckian, is a natural frontiersman, slaver, and traitor. He obtained notoriety for his deadly use of his iconic blade at the infamous Sambar fight eight years prior when he gutted the man after being shot multiple times. On October 27th, Bowie's 92-man reconnaissance party leaves the army in search of a new base. Bowie and his force follow the San Antonio River north. During their march, they pass two less than ideal missions and brush aside some Mexican scouts. As the sun is setting, they arrive at Mission Conception, located two miles away from Bejar with a horseshoe-shaped bend in the river nearby. The site proved to be the best position for the army's next base. However, 
Being six miles away from the main army at sunset, Boo's force is too far out and decides to camp for the night, contrary to Austin's orders. With the location found, Boo dispatches a courier to inform his commander. When Austin receives the news, the general is outraged at this insubordination as this is the very situation he wanted to avoid. With his army now split, there is a real possibility it could be defeated in detail. Fearing for the worst, Austin summons his officers and orders them to ready the march at first light. Back at Mission Conception, Boo makes all his preparations to defend the camp. Pickets are posted and a lookout is placed in the bell tower to watch for any possible attack. Those who are not on guard duty sleep with their arms. With every contingency covered, the Texans bedded down for the night, forced to anxiously wait to see if a Mexican attack will greet them in the morning. Meanwhile, in Behar, Coast learns of the isolated detachment and wants to crush it before the rest of the Texian army arrives. Therefore, he orders Colonel Uga Techea to lead a detachment of 400 men to surprise this isolated force when the early morning assault. As the morning sun rises on October 28th, a fog forms to reduce the Texians' visibility to mere feet. They have no idea the Mexicans are moving in for the kill. Around 8 a.m., Ugodechea's force announces their arrival with a volley that drives in the Texian sentries. With the surprise advance of the Mexicans, the Texians fall back to the goalie behind them. Once in position, the Texians let loose a slow but deliberate rate of fire upon the advancing Mexican infantry. Marching in lines, the Mexican soldiers are easy targets for the Texian riflemen and are quickly thinned by their accurate fire. However, the Mexican infantry are not the only ones being punished by this deadly rifle fire. The two guns brought to the battle become special targets for Texian sharpshooters, and not before long, no one dared to approach the guns without being picked off. Compared to the attackers, the Texans are virtually unscathed, despite the storm of leg coming from the Mexican soldiers. Demoralized after suffering heavy casualties without being able to return effective fire, groups of Mexican soldiers start to leave the battlefield and soon the entire force is retreating to the safety of Behar. While the infantry is retreating, some Mexican cavalry are sent to recover the lost guns. They are soon sent reeling when Bowie leads a counter charge capturing the Mexican cannons, turning them upon the fleeing Mexican soldiers and peppering them as they race back to the town. As the last Mexican soldiers retreat out of the range of the Texian rifles, the battle ends, lasting only 30 minutes. Just as the fighting ends, Austin and the Texian army arrive on the field. As the vanguard reaches the battle, they charge after the retreating Mexicans. General Austin calls for an immediate attack upon the town when he reaches the field. However, realizing that such an attack would be futile, Bowie and the others convince Austin to rescind the order. Despite the insubordination on the part of Bowie, the Texans have won another great victory against a superior foe. With an easy victory under their belts, the Texans start to have contempt for their Mexican opponent, who has not been able to defeat riflemen stationed in defensible positions. Now with a secure base only two miles from the outskirts of Behar, Austin invests the town, forcing the centralist garrison to go on the defensive. Hoping to end the siege as soon as possible, Austin rides the coast calling for him to surrender. Undeterred, Coast sends a note back unopened with a letter saying he will not correspond with the rebels. The next day, with no hope for a quick victory, Austin calls for a council of war. After much discussion, the officers vote to continue the siege. However, without siege guns and more men, the Texans could do little more than starve out the Mexicans. For now, the victorious Texans will have to rest on their laurels outside Behar. Even though Austin is able to bottle up the Central's garrison at Behar, his army's flanks are still in a precarious situation. The only other Central's garrison left in Texas is Fort La Pantalon, which is situated on the west bank of the Nueces River. With this outpost still in the hands of the Centralist, it could be used as a springboard for a relief column moving north from Matamoros to break the siege of Behar or attack Goliath the restore coast's vital link to the port at Capano Bay. The man who understands the necessity of destroying Fort Lepantalon is Captain Philip Dimmitt, 
the commander of Goliad. Worried about an impending attack upon his command, Dimmit decides to act without authorization from Austin and orders Adjutant Ira Westover to take a company and destroy the fort. On October 31st, Westover and 35 men march southwest to Refuria where more men join his ranks, and then march west to San Patricio, unknowingly bypassing a Mexican force marching upon Goliad. With a force of 70 men, Westover marches into San Patricio and forces the surrender of the undermanned fort on November 3rd. With the capture of Fort Lepantalon, the Texans acquire a sizable quantity of horses and weapons, most proving to be unserviceable. Once the Texans seize everything of value, they destroy the fort. However, just as the Texans are about to leave, they are attacked by the returning detachment led by Captain Nicholas Rodriguez, who turned his men around after he got word of Westover's approach. When the Mexicans arrive in San Patricio, they attack the startled Texans but are repulsed by their long rifles, losing many men in the process. Cut off from his base at San Patricio, Rodriguez falls back to Matamoros. With the garrison at Fort Lepantalon pushed out of Texas, Costa's besieged garrison at Bejar is the last centralist force remaining in the state. Although safe behind his barricades, Costa is unable to venture out of his walls in fear of pitting his poorly armed soldiers against the expert marksmen in the Texian army. Meanwhile, in the Texian camp, Austin is facing entirely different problems, undisciplined troops and dwindling supplies. His men volunteered the fight, not sit around. To deal with the monotony of the siege, the Texans spend their time drinking and taking pot shots at the Mexican garrison. All the while, the weather is getting colder and supplies are running out. As the army is more of a mob of volunteers than a professional force, it is difficult for the Texian officers to enforce discipline. By November 5th, a shocked Awesome watches his sizable army of 800 men shrink to 600 in a matter of days. Those who stayed try to endure the boredom. Unable to do more than just watch, a desperate Awesome calls for the consultation for help. Due to the flare-up of fighting in October, the consultation was postponed till November but finally convened on the 3rd in San Felipe. The consultation set up a functioning government to govern Texas until federalism could be reinstated in Mexico. While starting a provisional government, the consultation also organized a regular army and chose a 42-year-old Tennessean named Sam Houston as the commander-in-chief of the regular forces. Sam Houston, a veteran of Horseshoe Bend and a former governor of Tennessee, is a boisterous outsider who tended to belittle others. However, even though General Houston is the commander-in-chief, he's not allowed to touch the volunteer army under Austin that is camped outside Behar. He will have to raise his own force. Even though the Federalists in Texas now have a functioning government and a proper military organization, the consultation has done little to help the dwindling force besiege in Behar. General Austin has done his best to keep his army together, but the strains of command and the worsening weather have weakened him. Seeing this, the consultation appoints Austin as commissioner to the United States and is relieved as commander on November 18th. However, Austin is not going to leave without taking a chance to storm Behar. With reinforcements arriving such as the professionally looking New Orleans Greys and the departure of Ugarachea's dragoons from the besieged town a week prior, Austin decides to try to launch an assault on Behar. On November 21st, Austin orders his men to ready themselves to assault the enemy works, but is surprised to meet a wall opposition. Fewer than 100 men are willing to attack, forcing Austin to back down. On November 24th, realizing it is time to leave, Austin resigns his generalship and leaves for the United States. In his place, the army votes for Colonel Edward Burleson, the 42-year-old North Carolinian. Burleson is a veteran of the War of 1812 a well-known Indian fighter and has led a company at the Battle of Gonzales. Though the commanders for the Texans changed, the conditions have not. As the weather grows colder, General Burleson anxiously watches the support for the war drop among the army and public. Due to the worsening situation, the general is on the cusp of lifting the siege and withdrawing the army to rest and recuperate. However, just as Burleson is about to lift the siege, 
reports of a Mexican relief column stopped those plans cold. On November 26, one of the best scouts in the Texian army, Erastus Death Smith, rides into the camp and announces the arrival of a Mexican column approaching from the south. Smith spotted a caravan of pack mules heading towards the town. Burleson is worried that it is a trap laid by Ugadachea returning with reinforcements and sends Boo and a hundred men to reconnoiter the party. When the word about the caravan becomes public, a rumor spreads that these pack animals are carrying silver to pay the trapped garrison. Seeing an easy target, Boo and his force attack the helpless drivers a mile south of Behar, driving them away from the animals. With the Mexicans gone, the Texans rush to claim their prizes of silver, only to find bags of fresh cut grass for the garrison's starving horses. Irritated, the Texans named the skirmish the Grass Fight. Though disappointed about the lack of treasure, the Texans realize their siege is working and the Mexicans are desperate enough to brave the open range to acquire grass for their animals. Even though the Texans enjoyed the fight, it was only temporary. Once the siege returns to normal, the men's morale wavers, with many considering cutting their losses and heading for home. Luckily for Burleson, 450 volunteers vowed to stay on until the capture of Behar. On December 1st, Three Texans are released from the town and give exciting reports that the garrison is a lot weaker than expected, and the prospect of an assault looks promising. However, after Burleson makes preparations to attack the next day, his officers vote to postpone the attack, disheartening many in the army. Those who have been preparing themselves for the upcoming battle are outraged and mutiny. Whole companies refuse to show up to roll call and almost 300 men quit the army and plan to leave for home. An appalled Burleson, unable to control the fiery mob, announces his decision in the siege and go into winter quarters, hoping that spring will bring more men, bigger cannons, and full bellies to wage war with. For the first time since the Battle of Gonzales, after seven weeks of hardship outside the walls of Behar, the Texans admit they are beaten, not by the foe who is hiding behind the barricades, but by their own boredom and disorganization. A veteran of Lepantalan reports, all was in vain, no persuasion had any weight. A great many mounted their horses and left camp, expecting a total defeat. However, before the dejected Texans could pack up and leave, an outraged Ben Milam rides into camp declaring that he will lead an attack upon Behar. After returning from a scouting trip, Benjamin Milam is shocked to find the Texian camp in chaos. Upon learning that the army is going to lift the siege, Milam finds Frank Johnson and the two men march to Burleson's tent, demanding that they attack if they can recruit enough men for an assault. With no better option, Burleson agrees. Milam and Johnson call upon the men to join in their attack. Out of the 700 Texans left in the camp, 300 men answer the call. The remainder will stay and defend the camp the attack proves to be a failure. Milam knows the difficulties of going against an entrenched foe behind strong fortifications, no matter how low his morale is. To have the best chance possible, Milam divides his command into two divisions, taking the first himself while Johnson commands the second. Both divisions plan to enter the town from different points and link up at the military plaza. Milam knows only a diversion would buy a surprise necessary for his force to penetrate the outer defenses. For this, Milam calls on Lt. Col. James C. Nill, the artilleryman from Gonzales, to distract the garrison by firing upon the Alamo. Nil carries a heavy responsibility. If his diversion is by any way not convincing, there will be a wholesale slaughter of the Texan assault force. With a plan ready, the attack is set for early in the morning of the next day. In the pre-dawn hours of December 5th, the respective Texan units move to the positions. Milam and Johnson lead their commands to a point just north of the town, while Nil crosses the San Antonio River near the Alamo compound. Around 5 a.m., Nil fires his lone gun against the Alamo. As the boom of the cannon is heard, the anxious Texan infantry listens intently for the reaction of the enemy. Luckily, the plan works. Once the cannon is fired, the long roll is sounded throughout the town. Mexican infantry rushes to defend the Alamo against a supposed early morning attack. 
Meanwhile, once Milam and Johnson are convinced the garrisons are completely distracted, they begin their advance. The two infantry columns quietly rush into the town unmolested. After dispatching the sleeping sentries, the columns push deeper into the town, hoping to reach the military plaza before the garrison could react. Just when the attackers are halfway to the plaza, the Mexicans, now fully aware of their presence, greet the Texans with a blast of canister. In the crowded streets of Behar, they prove to be devastating. Unable to do anything against the flying wall of metal, the Texans dive for cover. Milam's men are forced into nearby buildings while Johnson's men rush into the Veramendi house. Now that the attackers are fully engaged with the garrison, the Texans are forced to fight street to street, house to house, and room to room. In the sniping battle, the Texans and their Kentucky rifles have the advantage over their brown bass counterparts. They slowly whittle down the opposing force. However, as the Texans climb onto the roofs of the various buildings, they finally meet their match. Mexican Cazadors, armed with British Baker rifles, prove to be equally deadly riflemen. Once on the roofs, the Texans have little cover from the Mexican sharpshooters stationed in the bell tower of the San Fernando Church. For the rest of the day, the two sides will take pot shots at each other until darkness ends the fighting. As the first day of the assault comes to a close, the Texans are elated about their initial success, being able to make a lodgment in the town without suffering severe casualties. General Burleson, along with reinforcements, visits the two columns, brings food for the men, and consults with Milam and Johnson about the next day's fighting. Though they encounter stiff resistance, both commanders agree to press the attack the following morning. The morning light of December 6 resumes the fighting in the streets of Behar. The energetic Texans push forward and slowly clear each house of sensualist defenders. The fighting is nothing like they experienced before. Open fields where two sides trade volleys. Instead, it is a chaotic melee, forcing combatants to grapple hand-to-hand -hand with bowie knives, bayonets, pistols, and club muskets. In Milam's division, an assault takes a strong house that enables the attackers to wheel cannons up to the front, leveling the odds against the superior Mexican artillery. The confident Texans grudgingly push their enemies from house to house until sunset suspends the fighting. On December 7th, the early morning light reveals that the Mexican garrison built a redoubt on the Alamo side of the river, which commands the Texian left flank. However, though initially formidable, the expert Texian marksmen pick off many and force the rest to flee, securing the flank. Meanwhile, back in the streets, a new strong house backed up by artillery prevents the Texans from gaining more ground. The men suffer at the hands of the stronghold. Only the dual effort of artillery and rifle fire compels the defenders to retire. Nothing seems to stop a methodical Texian advance through Behar. With each strong house that falls, the garrison's resistance grows in ferocity, hoping to stop the systematic advance of the Texians. Informed of the increased resistance, Milam goes to the Veramendi house to scan the enemy's defenses, looking for any potential weakness to exploit. At the same time, a Mexican Cazador in a tree along the river spots him. From that vantage point, the Cazador pulls his trigger and shoots Milam through the head, killing him instantly. Johnson, who's now the ranking officer on the scene, assumes overall command of both divisions. As word spreads of Milam's death, the enraged Texans find the Cazador and riddle him with bullets, watching his lifeless body drop into the river below. Soon, the rest of the Cazadors are cleared from the trees as well. Meanwhile, the terrifying house to house fighting continues. Texan attackers anxiously hack away at walls to get at their enemies in other rooms. When a breach is open, both sides shove their muzzles through the gap, firing indiscriminately. Only when the defenders are cleared from the room would this horrifying carnage end. As the sun goes down, the Texian invaders are in sight of their objective, the military plaza. Realizing that it is only a matter of time before the Texans reach his last position, Coast dispatches 300 cavalrymen to find Ugo de Chea in the much needed reinforcements. However, Coast is appalled when the expedition fails to return. The news of the betrayal is a bitter blow to the valiant Mexican defenders of Behar. December 8th dawns rainy and cold, reducing the effectiveness of the guns on both sides. Undaunted, the Texans push forward, hoping to capture the final objective, 
the military plaza. However, they are met with a ferocity not seen before by the Central's garrison, stalling the attack. Soon, the Texans overrun the Zambrano Road, a block of houses near where Milan was killed. When Coase receives news of the capture, he transfers his headquarters to the Alamo. Running out of places to retreat, Coase needs a way to reduce the pressure on his crumbling defenses. Thinking that the majority of the Texans are committed to the assault, he reasons that the Texan camp is vulnerable. He devises a plan to cut the Texans off from their base. If successful, the attackers would be forced to withdraw. That afternoon, Coase sends a combined force of infantry and cavalry to capture the Federalist camp. Unbeknownst to the Mexican attackers, James Nil, the man who started the battle, is waiting for such a move and has assembled a banner of artillery loaded with canister. When the attackers advance within range, they are surprised to find a storm of flying metal. As soon as the attack begins, it ends with the would-be attackers fleeing back to the Alamo. With a sortie repulse, Coase's hope rests in Ugodachea. Later that afternoon, Ugodachea slips by the Texan cavalry, arriving with a sizable force of 600 men. However, even though Coase receives as much need of reinforcements, they turn out to be more of a liability as many of the men are convicts who were marched to Texas in shackles. Not only is Coase barely holding on to the military plaza, he now has to deal with these unwilling soldiers. As the afternoon turns to evening, the Texans have one remaining obstacle between them and the military plaza, a fortified stone building called the Priest's House. Coast rushes three cannon and his remaining infantry to defend the building. At 11 p.m., the Texans launch a ferocious attack upon the Priest's House. The two sides blast away at one another, but after an hour of savage fighting, the jubilant Texans beat the convicts and take the house. Realizing that the plaza is lost, the remaining Mexican defenders flee to the Alamo. Hemmed in on all sides in the Alamo, with dwindling supplies, Coase has no other option but to surrender his command. Early on December 9th, Coase calls for a ceasefire to discuss the terms of surrender. After many hours of discussion, the two sides negotiate the surrender of the Bayhar garrison. Burleson allows the Mexican soldiers to take their guns and ammunition, but they have to leave the state, swearing not to oppose the reestablishment of the Constitution of 1824. After seven weeks of a grueling siege and five days of savage house-to-house -house fighting, the Texans emerged from the ruins of San Antonio de Bejar victorious. With Coast now expelled, the Texans have finally cleared the entire state of Centralist troops. Despite the danger and hardship experienced by the Texans in their many battles with government troops, they are extremely proud of their accomplishments. Extolling the volunteers, Governor Smith and San Felipe declared the soldiers as brave sons of Washington and freedom. The soldiers feel the same way too, with some saying, we consider ourselves almost invincible. With San Antonio now clear of enemy troops, and no more fortified outposts standing in their way, many think the war in Texas has been brought to a successful conclusion. Exhausted after many weeks of strenuous campaigning, many volunteers, including General Burleson, bleed the war is over and head for home. In the wake of Burleson leaving, Frank Johnson is elected as the new commander of the remaining Bejar garrison. However, for President Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, the war has only just begun. Outraged with the defeat of his brother-in-law in the streets of Bejar, Santa Ana is now determined to redeem the honor of both his family and country. The president pledges that in 1836, he will raise an army march north into Texas and unleash utter destruction upon anybody who stands in his way.